Let's begin talking a little bit about induction therapy and frontline therapy for patients with myeloma. There have been a lot of different changes in the way that we approach patients with newly diagnosed myeloma. Let me begin by asking you how you think about treatment goals and treatment approaches for patients across the board. So, Rafael, do you want to get us started? Sure. Well, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. I'd like to say that we used to talk about induction therapy, and we used to have to lay out the full plan for patients nowadays. Um, available clinical trial data suggest that getting patients into a good response status, ideally into an MRD negative status, appears to be a marker. It could be a biologic marker, but certainly a worthy therapeutic goal of putting patients into that very deep remission. So when we talk about frontline therapy, I think about the first three key steps. What will I do before transplant? Will I do transplant, which by the way, I, 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 for those patients that are eligible, I usually suggest I do, and then the post-transplant therapy. But I, I would say that's probably the most important point right now as I strategize for my own patients. Um, you know, mo most of the patients, and we'll talk more about this, are, are now treated uh, certainly with, with combinations that are able to achieve very deep responses, and we're getting to the point that we can measure those responses in the post-transplant stage. So thinking about it in phases is really how mm -hmm. you approach it. Okay. Correct. Heather, do you want to add anything? I would agree, and I think that getting to an MRD negative state or a very deep remission is a worthy goal for the majority of patients, but we also have to recognize that there's uh, a bunch of patients who have lower risk disease and can be converted to a chronic illness and revert to this MGUS type state and don't necessarily need to get to the MRD negative state. So. Our goal is also to recognize those lower risk patients mm -hmm. who can be maintained without um, having achieved such mm -hmm. a deep response. Yeah, yeah. Jayton, what do you think? I mean, I, I will often call this, this is a controversial area, I think, in, in myeloma across the board, and I'll often call that undertreating the good risk patients. What, what do mm -hmm. you think? So, you know, I agree. I mean, I think that the goals of the initial induction therapy are to get rapid disease control and then reverse end organ damage, and in fact now with our ultra high risk patients being treated to prevent end organ damage. So I think those are the key points as we get started with induction therapy, but uh, in my mind I think transplant is still an important part of how we treat patients. And so then it becomes important because just trying to get to an MRD level or a CR does not affect my decision to go for a transplant or not. And so I think though it's an important goal, I think getting disease control and then moving on for transplant I think is important as well. And as we move farther on down the road then we can aim for getting to those MRD levels. Okay. Maury, do you want to add anything? Well, I think what's nice about the multiple choices that we currently have mm -hmm. allows us not only to incorporate risk, but tailor and individualize our therapy for the 20% that present with renal failure. Mm -hmm. I'd handle that differently. Also, there's the elderly frail mm -hmm. that may not be appropriate candidates for transplant, and we've learned particularly at this meeting about sustained opportunities for good outcomes for the elderly. Mm -hmm. no, I agree with everything pretty much said around the table. I do think what we've learned in the last few years, though, is combinations is the way to go. I think we get good responses. We've learned over the last couple of years how we can best combine these drugs. And by doing so, we are seeing nearly 100% of our patients respond. And I agree with you, Sagar, when you say, uh, you know, we try and risk stratify patients too much and should we be under treating the low risk? Because if you do the combinations in these low risk patients, you are actually making them even better risk patients. So in my mind, at least, I believe in using combinations, and uh, I think the data is moving towards combinations, not just in the upfront setting. And at this meeting, you will hear more about combinations mm -hmm. even in the relapse setting. One of the concerns that I have with regard to this under treatment is the widespread misconception that myeloma is a monoclonal disorder when in fact it's a multiclonal disorder. And because these clones have variable gene expressions and therefore likely have differential drug sensitivity, if we try to narrow uh, our treatment too much, we're going to end up destroying sensitive clones and we're going to leave very aggressive clones behind. I always tell my residents that if you had two clones, one that was exquisitely sensitive, 90% of the cells, and one that was exquisitely resistant, 10% of the cells, and we undertreat, we'll kill 90% of the cells, we'll all be satisfied because we've achieved the VGPR with a 90% reduction and have a horrible clone left alone because we elected not to use multi-agent induction. Okay, 
Well, but I, I think I think certainly one of the points that I think Heather brought out was the idea that one size doesn't necessarily fit all. And I think that's particularly important in a disease where a patient's median age is 65 to 70. So we focused almost exclusively so far on younger transplant eligible patients. And I suspect our approaches are probably pretty similar across those. But what about the older patient, the frail patient? Age may not necessarily be the real discriminator. How do you all make those decisions about, and then what do you do? You, you've decided somebody's frailty index is too high. What are you gonna give them in that situation? The good news is that we now have the first data mm -hmm. that shows a, a doublet, RD, mm -hmm. it, uh, given continuously, mm -hmm. can achieve remissions and can achieve durable remissions in mm -hmm. these frail patients. And we don't have to necessarily expose them to the same toxicity that the alkylator, prolonged alkylator therapy or the neurotoxicity that uh, bortezomib can induce. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Well, I'd like to add to that. You, we talk so much about trying to achieve the best response and we focus a lot on the transplant eligible patient population. In all honesty, 70% of myeloma is above the age of 68, 69 and may not be a transplant eligible patient population. And there is data to suggest and data has been looked at in more than I think uh, 1,100 patients, and even in the older patient population, it's very important to achieve the best possible response in that patient population. The first data, Heather, I agree completely, has shown very nicely that RD is a great combination and that continuing treatment over a protracted period of time really increases that depth of response. We're using a uh, modification of a triplet combination. We're using the RVD light schedule, and I think Antonio has taught us very nicely from the frailty index, you have to be able to dose adjust, so that if you dose adjust even the older patient population, I do think you can give that triplet to them. You cannot use the same doses that you would use in a younger patient, and yet try and achieve the same CR or the near CR and the VGPRs that we're all talking about around this table. I think that Heather brings up that very important first trial of melphalan, prednisone, and thalidomide versus Lendex in two different uh, uh, durations. And one of the key findings at this meeting was an analysis of the second progression-free survival in the patients on continuous lenalidomide, and it wasn't significantly shorter, suggesting that the continuous exposure to lenalidomide did not allow for the emergence of a resistant clone and so that the early introduction of lenalidomide was really important for a positive outcome. So that begs can, the question that this, um, that we're inducing re resistance, and I think that in select patients, it's, it's not an issue, but we just don't know how to select those patients most appropriately. Which, which I'd like to, you know, put a plug in for, for some principles that we really need to apply to this, which is the whole concept of evolutionary medicine. You know, we, we're all aware of that, but the, the question is, when does that resistance and when do those clones emerge and then become a problem? And, and simple questions like withdrawal of the pressure that you're putting with therapeutics then allows that to happen, or does this happen despite continuation of therapy? I think those are very important points because the empirical data that we have from this clinical trial suggests, let's keep going. I think we're all in, in, in the mindset right now that chronicity of therapy is important, but these are the things that really need to be investigated in greater depth. Okay. I think okay. underpinning the philosophy of how we're approaching this, you know, when we use triplets in the frail elderly with dose reduction, I think most of us don't have in our mind to achieve a state of MRD negativity, right. where in the younger transplant eligible population, we're really trying to push the depth of response as high as we possibly can, and that may not be practical because of the comorbidities of the frail elderly almost certainly would result in greater treatment related toxicity. And so we really have a two-fold approach that is appropriately individualized for their stage in life. Mm -hmm. Jay? I just want to make a key uh, point, subtle but important when you talk about practical implement implementation of the data that we generate and then it was we implement in the community. And what I'm trying to get at is we know in the U.S. that older patients tend to be undertreated with in oncology. And so when we talk about the concept of frail patients, we have to make sure we differentiate that from older patients. Mm -hmm. And so Dr. Palumbo has a very nice app and to kind of identify those frail patients. So I don't want to make sure that we just say older patients should have dose-reduced therapy. We should make sure that we 
are able to identify those frail patients. And so make sure there's a subtle difference between saying frail patients should be treated differently as opposed to older patients. Mm -hmm. I think older patients should still get the best therapy forward as we move forward. So I think just a subtle difference that we have to as we implement the concept of frail into the community and identify those patients as opposed to just what may be interpreted as older patients. Yeah, that unfortunately sense. that index was just published in blood, I think. So yeah. there is a way to guide us um, to on, on how to do that because before it's been sort of in the eye of the beholder. That's right. Right. If you went to Arkansas and you were 85, you got a transplant whether or not you were frail. Um, whereas now I think there is, there is some objective way to try and sort sure. that out. So as we're in the uh, topic of under treatment and just to build on a point that Maury made before, I mean obviously and for our, for our colleagues in the community, you know, when to start treatment is one of the most important decisions mm -hmm. in the lifespan of a person who has a plasma cell tumor, a myeloma diagnosis. But once you have that diagnosis and you need to start treatment, one critical point is patients who have compromised renal function or who are at risk of either being there forever or losing more renal function. And I think that's one key area for under treatment. I, I just would like to remind everyone that is a medical emergency, needs to be treated right. promptly. Uh, we don't really like to spend days and weeks sometimes in the diagnostic procedures, but a person who has uh, renal insufficiency or failure attributable to myeloma, and, and usually we know that's clearly linked when patients have high serum free light chain, right. chain levels, that patient needs to be treated urgently. All right, it's affected my practice certainly because it's such an urgency. So. My practice, I've moved to using weekly bortezomib in patients um, with myeloma, but not for those who present with acute renal failure. In those patients, I feel the urgency for rapid response is such that I still adhere to a 1, 4, 8, 11 schedule because I want early exposure to a lot of drug to maximize the time to response. 